Welcome to the Whose Body Is It podcast. I'm your host, Isabella Malvin. For those who don't know me, I'm a birth worker, a life coach, hypnotist, and a former liberal feminist turned radical truth teller. On this podcast, I expose the forces at play attempting to control our minds and bodies, such as transgender ideology, pornography, prostitution, and so much more. Together, we'll untangle patriarchal lies as you listen to jaw-dropping interviews with women from around the world. Warning, while listening to this podcast, you might find yourself triggered or perhaps notice where you've been biting your tongue on the issues that matter most to you. In my coaching and hypnosis, I help women and men stop getting triggered by every single thing, cultivate resilience, stop unwanted behaviors, and increase self-confidence. You can book your first session at whosebodyisit.com, and you can find that link in the episode show notes. And I just want to say that it's because of your endless support that I'm able to interview amazing women, get their stories out, and produce regular episodes for you. So with that being said, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel on YouTube. And if you're listening in, leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And also consider making a financial contribution via the link in my show notes. You can also visit my activist sticker shop. My pro-woman stickers have the power to intercept transhumanist programming. So take a photo of your stickers out in the wild and tag me on Instagram at whose body is it? Without further ado, let's get into this week's story. First Nation scholar and radical feminist Cherry Smiley is done with the Academy. She began her academic career studying prostitution and male violence against Indigenous women, and with the space to study, reflect, and write, she grew angry. As you're learning and growing, learning from women who came before you, the anger is spilling out everywhere, she says, of her consciousness-raising process. It was cold comfort to know that so many of the harms she had witnessed or personally experienced were so much bigger than her. Writing about prostitution and female subordination, she soon encountered institutional bias against heterodoxy. Whether it was while hunting for a faculty position or seeking publication for her articles, Cherry found that the Academy only want you if you're going to do what they tell you to. And for her, this meant reciting the litany, sex work is work and trans women are women. Institutional orthodoxy was not the worst of it. The hostility she faced from resource officers and faculty for her transphobic politics prevented her from accessing resources and left her feeling alienated and hopeless. Radical feminist texts helped her feel less alone and, as it has for so many women, saved her life. In this episode, Cherry discusses what the dominant discourse gets wrong about colonialism and asks why it's always women who are given all the rules. Cherry, thank you so much for taking the time to record this episode. Um, I first came across your writing, I think in 2020, when I was being kicked out of a fertility awareness teacher training program. And I was furiously gathering resources to send to my peers and it didn't work out so well. I may end up getting kicked out anyway, but <laughs> since then <laughs> and starting the podcast, I've been wanting to speak with you. So um, would you just uh, maybe first start out by telling my audience who, who the, the ones who aren't already familiar with you a bit about your, your background just as a, as a woman. Sure. Well, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to to speak with you today, and um, for all the work that you do, I appreciate that as well. So, so thanks for that. Uh, so, my name is Sherry or Cherry Smiley. People are always like, "Is it Sherry? Is it Cherry?" I'm like, "It's either. It's all good." Cool. I don't have any like emotional attachment to my English name, so 
<laughs> call me what you want. Just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, so, uh, so, so, so that's me. I, uh, I live back in BC. I'm from BC. So I'm from the, uh, Itlikatmuk or Thompson First Nation is where my, uh, on my, my, my mother's side and, and from the Diné or Navajo Nation on my father's side. So, uh, yeah. So I am, I was out in Quebec in Montreal for quite a few years, uh, finishing a, a PhD. Uh, and really focusing my research on male violence against Indigenous women and girls, especially um, prostitution. And um, but kind of in that whole process, really came to a lot of uh, realizations and realized that I was kind of starting my research halfway through instead of at the beginning. So it was a very like it was a very um, life changing time, which I think it's supposed to be but maybe not in the way that, <laughs> that it happened for me, but I'm a former uh, frontline anti-violence worker. So, so I think that having that experience is something that gives you um, information and knowledge that I don't think you, you can't really, you can't, you learn things that you can't learn anywhere else. And so I, I really think that that um, has helped to, you know, be a, a foundation uh, for the work that I do. I mean, we can we can say all kinds of things, but when you're, you know, the the reality of it is this, and that's that's how it is. Um, and so when you're when you're there, whether it's you know on the anti violence worker part or you're on the other side, <laughs> so I've been on both sides. It's very hard. You would think it's very hard to deny a lot of the the kind of conditions like material conditions of of women's lives um so that's really informed uh what i do uh what i've done i was raised mostly by my my grandma uh my favorite she's my favorite person in the whole world she passed away a few years ago the ripe old age of 97 although when you'd ask her how old she was every time you'd ask her she'd say i'm 16 <laughs> oh, wow. I'd be like, all right grandma that's cool so yeah, she was such a huge inspiration to me and just somebody that she's just the coolest woman. And obviously I'm biased, but like objectively, <laughs> she was really cool, really funny. So I, yeah, so I owe a lot of, um, you know, my thinking and, and uh, my questioning of certain traditions or uh, cultural aspects, I guess you could say. I think I owe that a lot to her you know, and her um, uh, example, you know, that she provided to me growing up. So, yeah, I, that's, that's kind of me. I mean, obviously there's a, there's, <laughs> there's a lot more. I, I live with my, my partner. I have a male partner and we have two cats. That's me. So you worked at the Vancouver Rape Relief Fund. Is that right? Yes. So at Vancouver Rape Relief and Women's Shelter. And Women's Shelter. So when, like, when did... When did your like interest turn into research, like formal research? Like, how did you get so involved in like the institution of academia? And are you still in it? And we've seen so many people canceled, so many women canceled in positions of authority in institution. And so I was wondering if you could speak to, yeah, firstly, what made you want to turn your activism into more of a formal research and and be in the institution and then what has that looked like since you know all of the trans propaganda so when i really started becoming i guess i mean <laughs> i was i was like i was angry i think i've always i've always been angry <laughs> rightfully so i would say um but just but didn't have didn't have uh a way to understand that anger and didn't have a frame for that anger. So it wasn't until uh, I came to Vancouver that I really uh, began to or organize politically with other women. So be before that, I actually had a really amazing professor um, and she introduced me to, and the class to, you know, feminists like Dale Spender, for example, you know, bell hooks, like, all of these um, these really amazing women 
uh, authors that kind of, that began to give me um, a vocabulary uh, and help me to kind of begin to piece things together and understand this anger that I had and, and to begin to understand that things weren't my fault. And I think for women, I think so many women, we just go, we, 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 we never get there. We never, we never get, we never get to know that it's not our fault, you know? And so, so I began to kind of build this vocabulary and this understanding. But when I came to Vancouver and began to organize with other women, that was when I really began to understand. It's it's like <laughs> next level understanding. Um, you learn how to work with other women. You learn how to disagree with other women. You understand, you know, that it's 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 bigger than it's bigger than you, which is a a, a, a great thing. <laughs> it's a really good thing to 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 understand that and 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 believe it. I guess maybe that's where the organizing came in is to to understand what I was what I was reading and what I was hearing, but to actually begin to believe it started with beginning to organize with, with other women and with indigenous women. So, uh, so it's kind of part of the story. So I was, and I was, I was still, I mean, I'm, I'm still angry. <laughs> I was really angry back then. It was kind of, you know, as you're learning, um, you know, you're growing and you're learning and you're learning from, from women who've come before you and you're learning from older women and old women and, you know, you're still kind of new to this whole thing. So the anger is kind of like spilling out everywhere. And so I, you know, I was in that, in that situation, in that kind of learning mode for, for quite a long time. And what I did notice at the time was, uh, cause we were very focused on, uh, prostitution. So there was a court challenge to Canada's prostitution laws at that time. This was 2008 ish. Um, so things were, it was very, there was a lot of public discussion and attention on this issue. And, you know, it's a very contentious one, a very controversial one. Uh, but what I did notice was the like buckets and buckets and buckets of research, uh, papers, reports that were, that was coming out of academia, uh, that were very pro-sex work that were not at all coming from a feminist perspective or an indigenous women's perspective. Um, but just the sheer volume of research that was coming out of the academy that was in support of in support of, of prostitution was staggering. And so I was like, wait a minute, <laughs> this, th there's something wrong here. And realizing that I, you know, I think we, we we needed to be able to kind of access those institutions as well and be able to, uh, you know, come at this issue from, from a feminist perspective. And so it was kind of, I guess, in some ways to kind of have that. I wish that it wasn't that way. I wish that university didn't legitimize women. Like, I, I, I don't think that that should be the case at all. Um, but the reality is that, you know, it, you know, you have access to opportunities, you have, you know, your words are, 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 are seen in a certain way, but I, I definitely was like, all right, we need to, this is a, this is a, this is a, another way to go about and to also spend time, like spend time to, to research the issue um, and really make those connections with something that was very, very important to me. But yeah, just kind of seeing seeing this incredible volume of, of of research coming out of the institution, yeah. So I thought, well, why not? <laughs> um, you know, let's 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 give this a try and and see where it goes. And yeah, and so I was I was in school for a really long time, <laughs> doing all kinds of things. And now I'm not not <laughs> at all. Uh, involved in academia, I think it was a kind of a two-way decision. <laughs> mm. I I walked away. Uh, I realized I didn't want to be a part of that anymore. Like the frustration was just, it was so so hard. But also, I don't think anybody would touch me with a ten-foot pole <laughs> at this point. At this point, either I did have a few 
you know, interviews, in-person interviews at different universities. And it just, it didn't go very well at all. I was honest about, you know, my politics and they don't want that. So they only, they only want, you know, cause they have these, these different hiring schemes. So they only want an indigenous person if this indigenous person says what they want them to say. <laughs> um, but also, I mean, in Canada, we've had this recently, a lot of media coverage on, you know, individuals who claim to be indigenous, you know, who have gotten these jobs in academia and in different places. And then it turns out actually they're not <laughs> indigenous at all. Wow. Um, so it, you know, there's, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot, but they really, they really, they only want you if you, if you're going to do what they tell you to do. And that doesn't work for me. Well, I appreciate what you said about not wanting the institution to legitimize women or like not believing that that is necessary, but then also on the other hand, having this container and access to do the kind of research that you've done and that being like a, yeah, a challenging aspect, like the wanting it, but the not wanting it, like the needing it and wanting to use it, but also the, you know, perhaps even resenting it. Like I hear this all the time from women in, in, in academia who, you know, especially when you've been on this path, you know, on a long trajectory with the the PhD or the, the degree or whatever as the end goal, and then finding yourself in a, a situation that is just totally not for you maybe for any yeah. woman with a voice, you know, who's going against a dominant narrative. But um, can, can you speak more to the, like, specifically the frustrating uh, elements of, of being, you know, doing the work that you're doing, having the opinions that you have while you were in that, in that system? Yes. Oh boy. Um, when I entered, so I, I did a, I did actually a master of fine arts at um, Simon Fraser University, and then I went on to do a, um, a PhD in communication studies um, in in Quebec. And so when I, I mean, I think part of the 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 draw was you know creating being being able to you know to do this research that you know that I knew to be coming from a perspective that was a very valid perspective, having the time to, to read and to research, uh, also to create art. I do, I do love making art and, you know, it is a, it is a, a great way to uh, address these issues as well from a, a slightly different perspective. Uh, so when I, when I entered into the master's program, it was already a bit of a pariah because of my views on prostitution um, so often those those two things go hand in hand, um, women's, uh, the gender and debate and the, the prostitution debate. So I was already, I guess, kind of my reputation preceded me <laughs> on that issue. And I, you know, I had lots of public writing and, and, and things out there, um, on that. So, so that was, that was always a struggle. And I think whenever you're, in university and you're you're actually putting women first and you're actually centering women it, it's not an easy thing to do so there's always going to be that pushback one of the things for me well well one of the most important things uh for me during my my phd in particular was i relied on uh second wave radical feminist texts from you know 60s to 70s 80s like that, that's how I was able to say, you know, this is a valid perspective. There are others who have this, I'm not the first one, I'm not the only one. Um, and so really feeling comforted by mm -hmm. um, the women who had, you know, st actually started women's studies in universities, um, which has become something not at all, or anything but women's studies now, basically. Feeling really comforted by, and, and validated by, um, all of these incredible women uh, writers that had that had come before and activists. So, so I think if I didn't have that, it would have been way more difficult. Uh, as well as to have you know a really great network of of women, of radical women that you know I'm just I'm very I'm so fortunate to have some amazing 
um, friendships, some amazing, you know, sisters in this struggle. So, you know, without that, it, it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been possible either, but it really started when uh, there was an incident in Vancouver. It involved a, a, a young woman who was being asked to her and her group had been asked to speak at this event. And then, you know, it was discovered that, you know, she had connections to, you know, rape relief and she had, you know, connections to um, all of these, you know, women who had thoughts <laughs> and said them. And so her group was asked not to, not was basically told that they weren't allowed to, to speak at this event anymore. It was that moment that I was like, wait, like, I mean, things have been happening before right. and I knew women who were kind of do, working on this before and were just getting backlash, backlash, backlash. But it was kind of that moment, just the, the circumstances of that particular incident. I was like, oh man. So I wrote, uh, I wrote something uh, where I was very clear uh, on my, on my perspectives about gender and, and on this debate. Um, and then things just, kind of went downhill from there. So I was dealing a lot with the Center for Gender Advocacy, I think, at Concordia University. So was essentially being bullied by a man out of um out of that center who identified as a as a transgender woman. And and that basically kind of continued throughout my time at the university. I did make complaints to the university, nothing happened as a result of those complaints but was definitely targeted by other students, by staff um, at the wow. university. Had a lot of, you know, people saying a lot of things about me that that were not true, um, but, but really, you know, serious things, telling, you know, certain individuals not, not to work with me, you know, saying that I'm a, you know, that I'm a hate monger, saying that I'm this and that, you know, so that, that continued the entire, throughout my entire time at, at the university. Uh, I really did feel like I couldn't access um, services. I couldn't access what I was entitled to access as a student um, because of everything that was happening, you know, this bullying essentially that was happening. Um, and I do recall at one point um, I was um, sexually assaulted during my my time there in Montreal and I felt like I couldn't go to the the sexual assault resource center at the university because they were very closely connected to the center for gender advocacy, um, but also because they weren't women only. So I had to go all the way across <laughs> the the city. Uh, it took me a really long time to get there to um, to this one place that was women only. And so I know I'm not the only woman that has, I'm sure has had that experience in, in universities across Canada, uh, where you're not able to, you know, access these services that, that you really need in the, in the, this kind of crisis moment when you really need them it was, it was absolutely, um, disgusting. Yeah. It was a constant, constant pushback on, on basically everything that I was doing. Uh, and it just, and it continued and nobody did anything about it. You know, when I had circumstances where I asked, I asked individuals for help, like staff members or faculty, and they were like, "Yeah, no, <laughs> we're not, we're not going to help you. We're not going to help you be because of this issue, because of your, you know, your views on gender." And that happened with, you know, uh, my colleagues as well. So it was very devastating. It was devastating in a lot of ways when I was asking for help and sometimes on, on certain issues where I'm just like, Hey, this is an issue that is impacting indigenous women and it's wrong. It has nothing to do with prostitution has nothing to, has nothing to do with, with, you know, uh, transgender ideology. This is just, you know, this is wrong. You know, indigenous women should be able to live uh, without sexual assault and without sexual harassment. And was told, like, was told, like, to my face, no, I'm not, I'm not going to sign that. No, I'm not going to help you with that because you think the wrong thoughts, basically, right? So if I had come in there, you know, being very pro-sex work and being very pro, you know, gender and pro, pro-transgender ideology, it would have been very easy for me to 
gather support on, you know, different issues that I was working on or different issues that I was experiencing. But to me, that message, the message that they send is it is your fault. Mm. You do, you do deserve to be treated that way. Um, Indigenous women, you know, who aren't, don't get in line. You do deserve to be sexually assaulted. You know, you do, you, yeah, it is your fault. Um, because, <laughs> because you don't think what we think, you know, and because you don't do what we want you to do. And that is devastating, especially when you've really worked your whole life to understand and then believe the opposite. Um, it really does shake you up. Mm-hmm. Like all, all these adult women are being re-traumatized like the child or or, or women who have been let's say you know sexually assaulted as children or minors there's like the child brain that's like oh no it's me i'm the problem can't tell anyone blah blah blah. and then there's like ideally there's a maturation there's like a coming to there's a radical feminist circle there's a discovery of text of second wave feminism and you're like oh this is a global feminist issue. This is a, you know, this is, this is happening to me on the basis of my physiology. And then you're describing a kind of gaslighting, like you're in this institution, which is supposed to be like the, the smartest people or whatever that means. And then they're like, no little girl. No, but like, yeah. it's you. Basically. Yeah. You are, you are the problem. <laughs> you you are, deserved you are. it. It is your fault. Yeah, no, so it messes with your head uh, and it messes with you on that kind of intellectual level, but like emotionally as well. Like, even though I know I've, I've done a lot of work and um, you still, it, you know, it shakes you up. Uh, well, I had a couple, basically every time I had an interview, the issue came up. So I would get, for example, I would be asked, do you think trans women are women? And I would answer no. And then I just stopped talking because <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, but I didn't want to, you know, yeah. in, I didn't want to, in, to enter into to the discussion on their terms. I'll, I'll do that on my terms. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, questions to the, basically questions insinuating that I would treat individuals who identify as transgender differently, um, that I would treat them poorly because of, you know, how they identify Um, and that was, you know, I was like, that's, that's my character you're talking about. And, and I think that that's very, my work speaks for itself. And I think that that's a very serious, uh, serious thing you're saying about me or insinuating about me that I would, that I would treat individuals poorly for how they identify for how they, I don't know, the clothes they're wearing, whatever, whatever it may be. You know, I, I, I definitely took that um, as a, a, a very serious question of my character and was really, really angry. I, sh- I almost walked out. I should have walked out of that interview. I was so upset. Um, and partly because, I mean, I assume, too, when I'm in these rooms, you know, I assume that everybody at the table doesn't, like, passionately hate Indigenous women and are going to, like, you know, treat indigenous women like shit face to face and fail them because, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that there's goodwill in the room. I don't know. Maybe that was my mistake. Maybe I shouldn't assume that, but that's my assumption of everybody that was there. And of course there'll be mistakes and and this kind of thing. Um, But I assume that, you know, they're not a bunch of fascists, (laughs) you know, um, terrible, terrible people who do terrible, terrible things. Um, but that, 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 um, that good, that doesn't work both ways, right? The goodwill doesn't work both ways. It was very, I don't know what the word would be. I wasn't humiliated because I, I was like, I know, I know what I'm doing. Like, I know, I know what I'm doing. I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm, I'm confident in my work. I think my work speaks for itself, but it was definitely, yeah, it felt very much like a personal attack. Right. And, um, and just knowing, just knowing throughout my entire you know time at university that if I just said what they wanted me to say, everything, I would have had 
probably job offers coming in all over the place. You know, I would have been invited to conferences. You know, I, I, and I hear these things. I know that I'm, you know, no, don't invite her. You know, she's a turf. She's a swerf. You know, don't invite her. She's, you know, she's a hate monger, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, So was losing opportunities just out of the gate because of the work that I was doing. But I, I do want to say that I would do the same thing if I had to do it all again. I mean, I, I don't think I would. Well, I don't know. Maybe I would. But it is hard. It is awful. It is scary. At the same time, it's a privilege to be able to go to university and to be able to study and read and think. And that, that's like your job <laughs> is to think. Um, to have the 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 time and the space, you know, when women are are doing frontline work, for example, it's just like constant, constant, constant. It's crisis, 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 right? It's it's hard to find time to, you know, to 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 think and to read and to reflect and to do these kinds of things. So, so I did recognize that that was um, that was a privilege I, that I was able to do that, and I wanted to make sure that what I was doing was going to benefit women at the end of the day. So I, I do, you know, cause I hear, and I know I, you know, when I hear individual women, you know, they'll say it's, it's too hard to, to go into the university and to do feminist research. Yes, it is very hard, but it's not too hard. It's not impossible. And I do think that if you go into university as a researcher, as, and you're going in there because you want to um, benefit women in some way, um, I do think you have an obligation to do the research that you want to be doing um, in the way that you want to be doing it. Like, don't don't let them scare you. Uh, it's going to be a lot harder. It's going to be a you know a lot more difficult. But at the end of the day, I think if you go into the into the university. And you're too afraid to do the research that you want to be doing. You're you're getting those letters behind your name. You're getting something for you as an individual, but you're not using that time and and using that space, no matter how difficult it is, um, to do something that is actually going to further women's liberation. That I, I I just think that that's that's irresponsible and it's it's hard, but it's not impossible. It's not impossible. Mm-hmm. Would you maybe speak to what you were able to accomplish when you were in the institution? Like, and, and maybe that veers more into your, your book that's just been published. Um, but what, what, yeah, what were you able to do in that context? What findings did you come to? What groups did you start? I want to hear about all your, your, maybe your, your victories in, in that time. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. It was, holy moly. I learned so much, not, I think what was intended, (laughs) but you know, that's, that's probably where the best learning happens anyways. Um, But that, that time, like finishing my PhD, there was a lot. So all this stuff is going on in, in the university um, and all this stuff is going. So my, my younger sister and I, uh, we cared for both of our, our grandparents until they passed away. And that was life shattering, changing, incredible. It was all of those things at the same time. So that was going on in my life. There was a lot of death. A lot of people died during that time as well, you know, and then the the regular, like, the regular stuff that happens in, in indigenous women's lives was go- going on and keeps going on. It's still going on. So none of that stuff pauses <laughs> when you go to university or you start a job or anything like that. So you're dealing with all of this stuff in the university and then you're continuing to deal with all of this stuff outside of the university that just, that just doesn't end. So it is, it was a very, um, a very, very stressful time and, you know, things that were happening kind of both outside and within the university. I mean, I was uh, like, I was, I was, I was ready. I was ready. I was suicidal. I was ready to like peace out because it was just so much. 
you know, it's so much and you're being told at the same time <laughs> that you don't matter, right? That it's your fault. Um, and that's really at the at the root of these kind of sex work politics and and I'd say transgender ideology, like really at, at the root of it, it's telling women like to shut up. It's telling women you're wrong. It's telling women it's your fault. It's telling women you don't matter at all. Anything that you say, anything, you're nothing, you know? And I, I grew up being told that and believing that, that I was nothing. I was worth nothing, you know? And I think a lot of Indigenous women, it's not that you grow up thinking that you're going to be nothing. You don't think you're going to grow up. So, you know, you don't think you're going to make it to 30 <laughs> or 40, you know, or anything like that, right? Um, because you're, you, you think you're nothing. Everybody's telling you you're nothing and you think that you're nothing too. And I think that in some ways, like, that's, that's very particular to, to Indigenous women um, in these debates is that um, that level of kind of crisis that you come from that just that just follows you only now you're being told right you're being told again not worth it you know you're not worth standing up for you're not worth fighting for you're you're worth nothing you're garbage right so you know and and you can see i think whether women believe it or not you can see how women are why they would just say, okay, sex work is work. Okay. Trans women are women. Like what, what, you know, obviously why you, why you would just go along with it <laughs> because then you don't get those messages aimed at you in a direct way. They still are aimed at you. People don't necessarily tell that to your face, like looking at you in the eyes. Right. So it, it was, all of that was going on. Um, but at the same time, I just got to like read all of these texts from the second wave and all of these incredible books and broadsheets and activist journals and, you know, all of this, all of these, these things, these artworks, these texts that women had created before I, I had the time to sit and, and look at them and, and, and read them and reflect on them. I think in a lot of ways, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's safe to say for, for a lot of women, like radical feminism basically saved their lives. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's true for a lot of women. So, so being able to kind of counter what I was hearing and being reminded <laughs> of all of these wonderful um, pro-woman politics got me through a, a lot of that. And, and I remember... Uh, I was talking to, I can't remember who it was, and I was talking to somebody and, and they were like, because I have a, 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 a part in my, so this is my book, I encourage everybody to read it. It's, um, <laughs> it's a lot of, uh, it's my thesis kind of became this book, but I wrote in here, I don't know if I can find it, that I, 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 I you know, that I, I almost didn't survive, you know, this PhD, but I did. And I had somebody, <laughs> she was like, isn't that language a little strong? And I was like, no, no, actually, that was that was the reality of of this PhD. And the thing is, I was like, you're questioning when I'm telling you this is what happened. This was my experience. This is what happened to me. And you're questioning that. But if I were to say you misgendered me. And now I want to kill myself because you misgendered me. You wouldn't question that, right? You would be all over that. Like that's, right. you know, that's important. <laughs> but, you know, when it's, when it's a, a woman who's sharing her experience, um, there's doubt cast on that. There's blame cast on that. You know, insinuations that you're lying or you're blowing it out of proportion. You know, all of these, all of these things that happen to women, right? So it, it was a lot, <laughs> But, um, but being able to read these, these texts, really like reflect on them. So what ended up happening was thought, okay, my research is going to be about prostitution. Um, so I did go to New Zealand, which was great, and spent some time there looking at um, prostitution of Indigenous women there, and then spent time um, here in different parts of Canada uh, with other Indigenous women. So that was, you know, that was 
that was something else that was that was so awesome but so it was actually it was when I was in New Zealand uh, and I was talking to this wonderful wonderful woman and we were talking about the, the Treaty of Waitangi which is their kind of main treaty that was signed between the Maori and the white people white men there um, in New Zealand um, and we were kind of talking about this because I, I, I don't know very much about it and I asked her it went, it went over a couple of days there was this big meeting and I was like well how many women were at this at this meeting she's like mm, like I don't think there were any and I'm like well how many women signed this treaty and she's like mm, just a couple so it was like 99% <laughs> of the signatories, of course, uh, were, were Maori men, and it was all men on the other side. Um, and so I was like, wait a minute. That it was it was that moment that really got me um, reflecting on the theory that I was using um, to understand the prostitution of Indigenous women. And so what I what I learned in that process, I was like, wait a minute. So we understand colonization as uh, through a race-based lens. That's how we understand colonization. That's because men have defined colonization. <laughs> so Indigenous men have defined what colonization means in Canada. So, um, you know, and there's there's plenty of blind spots there. So I was like, what if, what if our, our understanding of colonization is, is actually sex-based instead? What would that look like? What would an actual woman-centered understanding like explanation of colonization look like how would that change our understanding of issues like prostitution for example so so I really kind of had to go back and really question a lot of the things that I had been told a lot of the things that I believed and <laughs> as I was I was like oh no I'm like now I'm gonna piss everybody off oh no <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> you know when I'm done you know not not just the you know, not just the the pro sex work and the you know the pro gender people, but <laughs> like everybody's going to be uncomfortable with this. Um, but it was just so necessary. It was so necessary to be able to uh, to reflect on that. It was tough. It was tough. Like you know, these things that I looking at my own um, beliefs and what I thought I knew, um, and being like, mm, maybe I'm wrong. Like maybe I'm not wrong, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Um, was really, it's really, really hard to do. Um, but you know, so, so this, you know, so this, so my book, woohoo, that's, this came out of, you know, this is like, what a, what an honor, you know, to be able to have this, you know, to, and to, for, you know, thanks to, to Spinifex Press, you know, for being willing to publish, publish this, um, you know, that's, that's incredible. That's, you know, what a, yeah, what an, what an honor. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't all bad, <laughs> you know, things came out of it that were good. I work at uh, women's studies online now, you know, and we really try and introduce women to, to radical feminism and provide a place for women to, you know, discuss whatever they want to discuss from a woman centered perspective. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so, 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 so good things, good things did come out of it. It just was a. It, it it took a lot out, took a lot out of me too. And I mean, it was this whole, cause I was still like up until probably my last year, I was like, there is wiggle room here. Like I can do this. I, I want to be a professor mm -hmm. and there is wiggle room. There is, you know, you have to fight for it <laughs> every step of the way, but it is there. But it wasn't really until my last year that I was like, no, like if somebody offered me a job tomorrow, I, I wouldn't take it. Mm. Uh, I can't, I can't be successful. Like I've, I mean, I was in the institution. I learned what I learned. I took what I what I felt was useful for me, and now and and now I'm leaving. Yeah, <laughs> like it, it didn't it wouldn't work for me to stay in that environment. So I just kind of needed to to use, you know, use it the best I could to to get what I could out of it. I think I did that. Mm. Wow. I mean, um, so many comments and questions but the impact of your trip to New Zealand basically changing your kind of shaking up your whole 
the the foundation of your whole analysis sounds pretty earth shattering. It it reminds me of Dr. Suzanne Forbes uh, Verling and I our conversation where she yeah she she talks about enslavement of black women through a sex based analysis where she's going through the hierarchy and you know it's just that is not the way that yeah most of us learned about colonization in school that is just not the dominant narrative that sex space even before all the trans propaganda you know when i think back to my very kind of standard both public and private school education it, it's not even close to a sex based analysis or even a class analysis necessarily but so that's a really interesting point and and also yeah a- entry for for those who are going to buy your book to know that that is that is the foundation of your analysis or that that has shifted in your in your research. I mean, have you seen indigenous feminists from Canada just drink the Kool Aid and and kind of get those positions that you you know refused or you know didn't even get a chance to get interviewed for because you refused to say you re- refused to uh, give up your your wrong thoughts? Oh, totally, totally. You know, and I, whether, you know, whether, I mean, maybe that's, they've looked at, you know, all of the research and that's the decision that they've come to. I obviously disagree with that, you know, that their conclusion, um, you know, or, you know, because it's just, it's just easier, right. It's just, Mm. it's, it's less struggle to, you know, to go that route. Yeah. There's definitely been quite a few. And I remember I wrote this article, um, it's not online anymore, but I, I, I think it will be in, in an upcoming um, book. So I'm hoping to publish another book. Mm-hmm. Um, and the title of the article was Trans Women Are Women or Else. And oh boy, <laughs> I think that was the title of it. Um, and so in, in that article, I was, I was basically saying like, Indigenous women know where babies come from today. And we know where babies came from back in the day we had to right it was it really was a matter of life and death it was a matter of survival so when you're when you're in this kind of pre you know before all these you know white men came here um and you're living in these these smaller communities you need to have the highest understanding of your body and your biology and those functions as you can in order to have the best chance of survival right so so basically the point of the article was that indigenous women knew where babies came from. And it was like a Twitter pile on, like, it was like the who's who of like indigenous Canada superstars had, I guess, very emotional responses to this article <laughs> that, that was basically saying like women have babies and women know where babies come from was insane. And it was very like, you know, it was, it was staff and students and faculty from my own university, from other universities. It was well-known artists. It was like women who were like, you know, had uh, were like publishers and like very, very high profile, mostly indigenous women (laughs) just like, came at me and I mean I don't really use Twitter because it's such an awful place so you know I don't really use it so I I would imagine some of it is is still there because I just not going to waste my time you know responding to these these very um these these uh comments and and weren't coming from a a good place they weren't coming from a place of engagement right it was just like shut up you know you you should be ashamed of yourself your grandma would be ashamed of you you know these kinds of kinds of things um and I was like you don't know my grandma (laughs) um (laughs) I think she's very proud of me actually um yeah it was uh the the backlash was and it was I mean I think often what I noticed that was different was that oftentimes it is it's very like random people but this the majority was were like well-known high-profile indigenous uh women and men in Canada that were, you know, having a problem with, 
with this article that I had written. And and like, and again, it's, you know, you get comments like, like, this is a hate filled article, you know, it should be taken down. I didn't read it, but it's awful. <laughs> You're like, they didn't even read it. Ah. Oh my God. Um, you know, how can you, how can you make that claim? Right. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so there's definitely that. I think the kind of average native person in Canada, native woman in Canada, I think is, I, I don't think is like a trans activist, mm-hmm. for example, mm-hmm. or a sex work activist. That's actually, that's, right. that's been my, my, in my experience, it's been opposite. Um, you know, when I, when I go and I talk to indigenous women about these issues, they're like, yeah, no prostitution. It is, it's awful. It hurts, right. It hurts women. And um, yes, I know, you know, I know where babies come from, oh my God. you know? And so, it's uh and it's it's kind of connected i mean it's so i i I talk a lot about my grandma just because she was such a huge influence on me but i remember asking her what what that was like before and it was funny because if i didn't ask her in the right way she, she would say like i don't i don't know like so if i was like hey grandma were there men who identified as women and women who thought that they were men women who thought that they were men like before she'd be like I don't know and I'd be like so I had to ask her to be like grandma like uh back in the day what did the old people say (laughs) about this or about that Mm -hmm. and I just I because she she was my old people right but she had her own old people that she would refer to and and kind of answer the questions in that way um and she said no she's like no um she's like there were some men that began wearing women's clothes, but that was after white men arrived. And, uh, and she's like, and everybody knew there were men that were wearing women's clothes. And so we hear it all the time, right? That it was like this crazy gender craziness. <laughs> like um, that, you know, we, we hear this, we're told this, that in indigenous cultures, there's like a million different genders and, you know, that it was like the super like progressive uh, place. I don't, I don't know. I, I think it's bullshit. I do. And I, I think that, and I, I address this in my book, but in a lot of ways we can't ever know for sure. We, we know, we know what we know from the stories that are passed down to us. Right. That that's how we know, but we can't. We we weren't there. We can't go back in time. <laughs> we don't have like our you know time travel DeLoreans. Like we can't ever know for sure. But I don't think that we that we that we have to either. I think that my understanding, and this was kind of part of you know I, I address this in my book, but it is kind of um, this all came about because my beliefs were shaken up, right, and my foundation was moved a little bit as I was doing this research. But my understanding is that, um, and what I know is that Indigenous women and men and children had to be as autonomous as possible. So in order to survive, for example, if only men knew how to hunt, for example, and only men hunted. If something happened and the men were gone, I don't know. Women women had to know how to do that too. Mm. They, they had to have the knowledge. They had to have the ability uh, and the opportunity to be able to hunt as well. Um, and that just makes sense when you're living in small communities. You know, it doesn't make sense to have half of the community know how to do something and the other half has no idea how to do that. Mm. Um you know, in case there's there's a, a situation, right? Same thing with, you know, with childcare, with gathering, you know, building homes, all of these kinds of things, right? Like you really, you you needed to know um, how to be able to do that. Just, I mean, I think it just, it's just common sense because <laughs> mm-hmm. um, that, that gives you your best chance of survival, right? And my grandma used to say to you, she used to be like, if you were thirsty, like you went to the river and you, you drank. If you were hungry, you hunted or you went and, and gathered some food. And, um, you know, if you, if you needed a house, you, you built your house. <laughs> so, you know, women had 
both access and, and the knowledge to be able to take care of ourselves, you know, and we, that's been taken away from us, right. In, in all kinds of different ways uh, today. Mm. So that kind of speaks to this idea, I think of, of like gender roles. So there, my understanding is, you know, there was perhaps, you know, spiritual moments that, you know, where it was a uh, woman only or, or men only circumstances. I mean, I think that's, that's, I have no comment on that. That's, that's fine. But this lie that there was like a million different genders, it just, it just, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense because you have more, more genders. You see more genders, more boxes when the, the gender roles are very strict. Mm. And that wasn't the case, right? That it was actually quite loose and it, and it had to be because women had to be able to hunt, men had to be able to help raise children. Like you just, you had to, this is how you were functioning. This is how you survived, you know, in this, um, in this culture. So, <laughs> so it's, I, I, it, it doesn't, it just like logically doesn't make sense that, um, that there would be all these different genders. So the reality was that it was, it was a lot more relaxed and the, the gender roles were a lot more fluid and, um, you know, individuals could do what they wanted to do and were still, you know, male or female while they were doing it, um, you know, and that was fine. And I think that this is, this information is just used to silence women and women become very afraid, especially non-Indigenous women, but even Indigenous women become afraid to, to challenge that, you know, and even this kind of understanding that, um, that homosexuality was 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 uh exalted almost right um right. it's not my understanding yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah it's kind of like it was what i understand and maybe this isn't true in in all cases but i would say probably in most is that it just was it was accepted and that that's it it wasn't better than it wasn't less than it was just a part of life mm-hmm. um and there was just this general acceptance mm-hmm. of of homosexuality and so i can understand you know women wanting to like hold on to this or, or or even hold on to this idea that women were the, you know, that it was like super matriarchal and that it was, you know, women had all the power. I don't think that that's true either, but I can understand the the kind of knee jerk reaction because it's a good, it's a good thing, right? It's a good thing to romanticize this, this way of, of life and, you know, to think about, you know, women as, as, you know, having all this power and, and so, so I, so I, so I understand that. And, and I, I used to say that all the time too. Like I used to say, you know, women were, were, you know, we had this position of power and then that was taken away from us. And I, I don't think that anymore. I do think it's a little bit more complicated than that. It was different. I do think it was different and it was different because the foundation of the culture is different, right? So the foundation of most indigenous cultures, and you can say this, globally there's a lot of connections is is one that's based on relationships which is very different than for example men and their culture being based on entitlement and accumulation and domination right so the 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 kind of the foundations of the culture are a bit different but that doesn't mean that women weren't discriminated against because they were uh, women were discriminated against because of their sex. That continues today. So, for example, we see that a lot with the um, discussions around menstruation, which just are so frustrating for me. <laughs> when so, I was ta- I was when I got to university, I was taught that you're not supposed to like serve people when you're on your period. You know, you're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to do that. And the reason that um, that you're not supposed to do that is because women are like super powerful at this time. Um, and I was like, okay, that sounds good to me. All right. And then as I got older, I was like, wait a minute, hold on. We're we're as women, we're being restricted. We're being told what we can and can't do once a month, every month. Um, and this never happens to men and boys. They never, they don't, they don't get restricted. They're not told that they can't go here. They can't do that, you know, at this particular time. 
And it also just didn't make sense to me. Like when I thought about it, you know, before a white man came, I'm like, if you had all of your women sitting out for like a week at a time, a week to 10 days at a time, I don't think that would work. Mm. Like women would have to continue to do like daily living, you know, especially, I don't know, during like winters when things are really harsh and, you know, you're in a harsh climate, like you can't afford to have half of, half of your population sitting out, um, you know, in a hut somewhere. So thinking about that, but then also thinking about um, like the pressure on women. So whether this was traditional or not, I don't think really matters because it is how things are now. So now you're told that you're, you know, you're, you're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to do that when you're on your period, you're told this is traditional. Um, And whether it was or wasn't, doesn't really matter because it's, it's only, it's only ever women, like historically, it's only ever women that have been limited or restricted uh, because of our sex over time. And I remember my grandma saying um, when she was young, because apparently you weren't supposed to, one of the things you weren't supposed to do when you have your period is to walk behind elders. And my grandma, she remembers she got, she was so frustrated at that, that she was like, if you don't want anybody to walk behind you, why don't you go sit in a corner? (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, go grandma, go. She's like, and I, you know, I'd ask her about these kind of traditions or these Mm. restrictions. And she'd be like, that's stupid. That's stupid. She didn't let culture or 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 cultural claims restrict her in any way because of her sex. Mm. Um, and I remember when I went to university and I began learning these things about what you're supposed to do and not supposed to do when you're on your period. I was like, at the time, I was like, why didn't my grandma teach me this? <laughs> now I know why, because <laughs> she was awesome. <laughs> um, and you know, and she didn't want to teach her granddaughters to be restricted because of our sex either you know, and not do things or, or not say things or whatever, um, simply because we're, you know, we're, we're female. So it's, um, yeah, there's definitely a lot, I think, of misinformation floating around. I think there's a lot, and it's on purpose, I think, to try and, and, and shut women up about these things that are supposedly traditional that had to do with gender or gender roles um, these kinds of things. It's, you know, it's mostly just used to silence women. And I mean, the other thing too, is that even if that was the case, like, why can't it change? So let's pretend that, okay, that was the case and that is traditional. Why does it have to keep being that that way? Like, why can't we change it? And I think that especially with indigenous cultures, right, there's this understanding that you're stuck in the past it's like you're not allowed to change that culture when everybody else, everybody else and their cultures are changing and evolving and growing. It's like, oh, no, you're supposed to like, you know, wear, wear these like skirts, which I don't agree with at all. There's this kind of newish thing where you're supposed to like wear these skirts that are like, I mean, like, you can't even like, like run in them, <laughs> but you're like supposed to like wear these skirts and, you know, and I'm just like, no, I don't think so. I, I don't because men don't have they don't have a requirement right mm. they don't they're not supposed to wear this or, or wear that and you know I think that there's many, many many ways that we can express our culture and our worldview and we don't have to choose ways that are discriminatory towards women we can do it in other ways we can make up our own ways you know mm-hmm. to to share um, our culture and to Keep that worldview going because at the end of the day, they, at the end of the day, like that's what it is, right? It's like it's this un- way that you understand the world, and then the practices, the cultural practices, those can shift and change over time, and they should, you know, as just as we shift and, and change over time. So it's, um, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a tough one, and I've gotten in trouble. I've gotten in trouble before <laughs> for doing things that you know I wasn't supposed to do because. Mm-hmm because I'm a girl or, or because I was the girl because I'm, I'm female. Um, so, you know, they, that, you know, it continues, uh, it continues to happen, but there are lots of indigenous women, um, you know, who, who do push back against, against um, these forms of discrimination and, you know, just don't, don't stand for it, whether it's traditional or not, whether it happened before or not, doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's not okay. 
it's not okay. And, and we see that. I mean, we see that across Canada in terms of Indigenous leadership. Um, you know, it's men. It's men. It's generally always been men and, and men's interests that have taken center stage. And women have been kind of pushed to the margins. So it is, you know, in that kind of sense, comforting as well, you know, to know that, you know, there's a whole bunch of um, Native women out there who are just like, mm, nope, <laughs> not going to do it that way. <laughs> you know, I'm going to do it this way. And I'm going to, you know, teach my my children, you know, that, that we don't have to discriminate against women. And that doesn't have to be part of our culture. Well, the cyclical living thing is so interesting because there's such a there's such a trend right now in like the reclamation of the menstrual cycle and like home birth. And it's all about, you know, encouraging and giving women permission to rest, to take the 40 days after birth, to take that week off uh, of a month, uh, to embrace the cyclical living, to say, okay, you know, men's physiology is based on a 24 seven cycle. We women are not like that. We operate all roughly on a 28 day cycle. So how will our world look different if we lead through, you know, th our biological states uh our reality so uh, you're bringing up so many interesting points that are just making me question all of that and, and just like the space in between where we acknowledge our biological reality and our distinct differences uh especially those that are the basis of our oppression you know like questioning the surrogacy industry and prostitution and and that but then where is the space where we are not then creating more prescriptions like you must sleep like what you're describing you know like you must rest for a week at a time and and personally that has never resonated like i have very but i also have very um easeful bleeding weeks to the point where i've never once thought or longed for a week of being horizontal in bed this just doesn't resonate at all and i have thought am i just so have I have I been touched by the patriarchy so hard that I can't, you know, embrace that? Um, but but the distinctions that you're making are okay. Yeah, okay. Well, what is you know what is called traditional? What is act is that actually still serving women in 2023? And so, how do you actually make a choice around that? You know, for the very few choices that I think we we have as a sex class, and then what you're describing within indigenous communities, where is that choice? to be self-determined and self-actualized in, in that. I haven't really heard about it. Um, I mean, I, like, I, I, like what you're saying about, but that's something that like white women are kind of into yeah. now. Like, is For this, sure. <laughs> <laughs> this, I, I remember talking to my grandma cause she was like, yeah, she's like, we couldn't cook. She's like, I didn't mind that part. She's like, that was fine. But <laughs> it's like, cause the question is, is like, well, why can't you just rest when you need to rest? right oh like God. like why why does right. it have to be this right. and what if you don't want to rest what if you were like i'm gonna make this fucking ginormous dinner uh because i'm i want to have this big celebration and i want to i want to cook this big dinner like yeah. for myself and eat it all like you know it's like um it's just these these rules um and, and whenever you have have those rules and they're only placed on women whether it's like you can't do this or you have to do this um i think it's it's just it's not it's just not good for women like i think we should be able to rest when we're tired and if that happens to be when we're on our period like i've got some pretty vicious cramps sometimes for sure i'm gonna rest but when i'm not on my period and i'm tired i want to be able to rest then too <laughs> um so Right. Yeah, I think it's um I think it's it's just putting making uh making this is making up rules for women is just not I don't agree. It's not a good idea. <laughs> this is such a refreshing this this I mean the whole conversation but the, particularly this part cuz I'm just inundated with my uh I used to teach reproductive health and I was helping women come off hormonal birth control which is a whole nother thing and maybe something we could talk about another time you know just the the way that indigenous women are targeted by the medical paradigm specifically you know their reproductive systems and pills and patches and IUDs and just all the 
all the stuff that white women are just waking up to the horrors of, you know, uh, in the past, really just like 10 years. I mean, Oh, totally. I mean, when I first went on birth control, I can't remember how old I was, but, um, you know, you don't really know anything about anything. Um, but they immediately put me on Depo Provera, ah, the shots. Wow. Um, and so it's now it's been, you know, over t- time that I've learned, especially when you're young, like the risks of that, but disproportionately indigenous girls, they would just put, put you on that anyways. Like that was like the first, that was the first option, you know, cause there's this assumption that, you know, you, you, you can't, re- you can't remember to take your birth control or whatever. Right. Like, so yeah. So kind of realizing that too, like the, how, how, how that's played out in particular ways for indigenous women and, you know, and this whole idea too, that you're really supposed to have babies. Like, I think all women, we are under that pressure mm. where that's the expectation, but indigenous women, like, holy, you're supposed to like, you know, have a ton of babies and a ton of babies real young. There's this pressure and this expectation um, that is like, very, very, very strong. Um, and, it, you know, it's all intertwined with carrying on of culture and like, you know, decolonate, like all this, this kinds of whatever. But I'm like, I don't want to have kids. I don't like kids. And you're supposed to you're really supposed to like, I don't like kids, but you're not supposed to like, how dare you? You know what I mean? Like there's this, this very, like this idea of motherhood in indigenous cultures is like next level baby factory kind of stuff and it's very harmful it's very very harmful for for women because i think that's um especially like young girls because that's for different reasons indigenous women will become you know start having kids quite young um and i think there's a lot of reasons why that happens but i I do think that pressure that's on us to have to have kids and to have you know a bunch of kids is something that it's very hard to it's very hard to resist that, that kind of expectation that, that, so yeah. So I think it's, it's true for all women, this idea that we're supposed to um, have, have children. Uh, but it's very, it's, it's very particular pressure um, on indigenous women. That makes sense. I mean, just based alone on like any population that's been, you know, affected so drastically by a genocide, there would be a, like conscious or unconscious right push to procreate and repopulate whether it's under the guise of you going to your own separate planet like in mormonism or you know <laughs> after the holocaust you know whatever mm-hmm. that 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 makes sense then i also wonder if the understanding and the impact of actual sterilization going on in these communities like there's also maybe that is also and then all the things that you're talking about which is just the maybe the taking away the the choice or um the implication that that there is you know no other way to to move forward as a as a modern woman but now i just want to do a whole birth control episode <laughs> talk about just the reproductive <laughs> crisis or um the med- i mean i'm curious to know what if and if you don't want to speak on this that's fine but what was like the whole COVID lockdown? What's your take and your your vantage point on on what went down the past three years and how that how did that affect you know your the communities that you're involved in and a part of? I'm I'm still figuring that out. <laughs> okay, I think <laughs> it's yeah, it's yeah. I mean, I I I yeah. I, mean, I think we can very clearly see the impacts on women for sure in general, but yeah, it's uh, I don't know. It's, it's a whole, I feel like ask me like 10 years mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. and maybe I'll had, you know, kind of enough time to reflect on, mm-hmm. on like the, the more um, the details of it, you know what I mean? Um, I just think it, I mean, I think it showed very clearly the status of women globally and, and how terrible that is. And I, I think, it decreased, you know, the, the, the status of women uh, globally as well. Um, so I, I'm, I'm pretty sure of those two things. 
but you know, all the rest of it, I think was, was we'll just take, I got to think more about that. It's just been a like very, yeah, we live in a different world now and there's, uh, you know, lots to reflect on. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is there anything we didn't get to that you wanted to speak on? I think one of the the most <laughs> succinct. I, I know I'm not I'm not very succinct, but one of the most succinct ways that I can think of to to describe the change that happened for me uh, as I was doing my PhD was in the past I used to say that patriarchy was imposed on Indigenous communities, and I think that that's the that's the general understanding. But now um, I think that. Indigenous men adopted patriarchy. And so that, that's a very, it's a very important uh, distinction. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it really helps us understand, really understand like the, the crisis of, of male violence against Indigenous women and girls in Canada and understanding that that male violence is coming from all men. It's coming from men, Indigenous men, it's coming from non-Indigenous men. It, so it really helps us understand really helps us begin to understand that issue in a way where we can actually get to solutions. And the way that that issue has been degendered by governments, by organizations, you know, in the, in the inquiry has, Mm -hmm. is just a slap in the face, I think, Mm -hmm. to indigenous women who fought for that um, for so, so long. And I think, just with the inquiry, you know, it was this understanding, you know, this male violence against Indigenous women as, you know, as genocide. Uh, I would argue that it, it's not a genocide, it's a femicide. And if we if we look at it from that perspective, like an actual woman-centered perspective, where women are more than the conduits for colonization to happen through, uh, so Kimberly Crenshaw, for example, and um, other other women have kind of theorized this, where where women are, yeah, we're more than like representatives, or we're more than collateral damage, basically. So when when we think of it only, so even if if we take the issue of male violence against Indigenous women and girls, and we look and we decide that that's a genocide, um, we're, we're, what we're saying is that you know women and girls are the, the, the conduit through which this genocide happens and that it's actually men <laughs> and, and, you know, men as the nation and the nation as men um, that are the, you know, the real targets and the real victims. And so, um, so I think if we come at it in terms of a femicide and look at that issue from a woman centered perspective, we're going to, we're going to come up with different. And I mean, that whole, that's a whole other <laughs> episode the 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 takeover of um transgender ideology and identity politics that took over that inquiry is like awful it's awful what happened and it's 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 makes me so frustrated to know that women fought so hard for that and then basically at the 11th hour we're basically booted out of our own inquiry um, and it became about everybody else but women was just so hard to see, <laughs> so hard to see. So it's like we've had this inquiry, but we still haven't had an inquiry on male violence against Indigenous women and girls mm. yet. Like we're still waiting for that. <laughs> so yeah, so that that's a whole that's a whole other a whole other discussion is what happened there. And I, I do know that basically. I think it was their mid mid report or there was like an interim report where they said that they decided to in- make it inclusive, right? So that the inquiry was about women and girls in 2S LGBTQIA plus. And they would say that every time they wrote, every time they, it, like it took up so much time, but those who were leading the inquiry, there were, there was this, a very short paragraph that just said, you know, basically, uh, we were contacted by groups, I'm guessing trans activist groups, um, you know, to say that we should be inclusive. And so we decided that we should, and we did. And they just made that decision. And it just, there was no, um, 
there was no discussion about it. There was no like, hey, what about this? Or like, how is this going to impact women? None of that. They're just like, oh, okay, you know, they caved to this pressure. Uh, and then that was it. And the decision was made. And, you know, you just had to just had to just had to deal with it. It was awful. And I mean, the whole inquiry as well was very like pro-sex work, um, which was a huge problem, like a huge problem. Like, and from the get-go. So there was, yeah, we're we're still waiting. <laughs> We haven't had a proper inquiry yet. Oh my gosh. I mean, you don't even hear the word femicide anymore. Like in any feminist literature publication, uh, mainstream cover. I mean, there's no, it's such a, it was actually a new word for, I mean, it speaks to my, my life experience that it was a, a pretty new word for me, even, you know, three, four years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. to be like, oh, what is, you know, what is this femicide thing? Um, uh -huh. It's a very useful uh, frame, a very useful frame. I think it was, it was Diane or Diana Russell um, that kind of uh, conceptualized that that term and, um, and that concept. And so definitely, um, I'm not sure because I know she passed away a few years ago, so I don't know if um, she had this incredible website where it had mm -hmm tons of her writings about femicide and um so I don't know if that's still up or not but uh, I mean even that that word itself is now being even though we don't hear it <laughs> you see you know it's like well what about you know trans women you know is that femicide now so it's like even <laughs> even in the, the few areas where we are able to use that term um that's being taken you know they're trying to take that away from us too by including men as victims of femicide. So wild. Ridiculous. Ah. But yeah, very useful concept, useful term. So uh, I think um, people should, should, you know, read, read up on it and, you know, see what they, see what they think. And if it helps, it helps their thinking. And I, I just think like, I guess maybe I'll just end with this. Cause I, when I was younger, uh, an angry, angry, well, I'm still, I'm, I, I'm like same, same anger level, but just better ways to express it and understand it. But, um, I always used to be really like, like anti-theory. Like I was like, theory is so dumb. Like theory is like, you know, it's all these fancy words and it doesn't make sense. And, you know, you have this, you connect it with, with university. And I, I do think that universities are very invested in making theory complicated and making it so that you can't understand it. <laughs> um, it's kind of how they operate. Uh, so in that sense, you know, it, it, it is true. And, you know, you get all these ridiculous theories that come out of academia that you're just like, what, what the heck, man? Like what, like this has nothing to do with my life. Right. So this, this, this disconnect that we're kind of led to believe between like theory, theory and reality but I think when we talk about feminist theory um, and once we're kind of introduced to that, I think that they, they, they do that shit on purpose. They try and keep theory away from us, like all theory, including feminist theory, because it is so important. It is so important. And, and I love how Marilyn Fry in her book, the politics of reality, she, she says that theory, like the, the mark, the marker of a good theory is if it helps you understand better mm. so and I was like yeah I like that that makes a whole lot of sense and it, it kind of like demystifies theory um and 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 as women like helps us understand why it's important and so yeah all it is is it helps us understand our lives and other women's lives better and if it if it doesn't and it makes it more complicated then it's not very good theory so yeah. So, so I, that was one of the things too, that really shifted for me was understanding how important like the action is and, and, and how like that, that is incredibly important, but it needs to have this, this um, theoretical foundation. And that theory doesn't have to be what we think it is in our minds. We can make it anything we want it to be. Right. And so uh, as women, we can create theory, we can criticize theory, we can adjust it, you know, it changes over time as we learn, um, but that it just is a framework 
for us to better understand our lives. Mm. Mm. Thank you for naming that. And gender ideologies just mask confusion, like migra- I always say migraine inducing confusion. So yeah. how could that? Does it make any, any sense? Right. No, <laughs> it's like zero, zero but, but to confuse it's us. <laughs> Zero sense. Zero sense. Zero sense. Yeah. And you just can't get a straight answer because it doesn't make sense. No. Right. Like at the end of the day, it doesn't make sense. And so they keep trying to explain something. It doesn't make sense. And it just makes less and less sense. Like the further you go. Yeah. Not, not a good theory. No. (laughs) Wow. Well, I learned so much from you and I, gosh, I wish you were a teacher because you're really good at teaching and explaining and, and pacing and, and yeah, you've given me so much and I know women listening so much to consider and to think about, and um, I'm going to link your, your book in the show notes and just thank you. Thank you for your time in this conversation. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. And I will say, um, so we are, we will be offering courses on women's studies online um, that I'll be leading. And so women will be welcome to to sign up and take those. But yeah, thank you. Thank you for the work that you do. And, you know, I know it's not easy, um, but the more of us that do it too, right? The easier it is. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with a friend or family member who needs to hear this content. And if you do share it on social media, don't forget to follow and tag me at whose body is it. So until next time, 